when you're out. Right. Yeah, um, unless someone else want to do the intro. <laughs> um, Are you supposed to introduce it? No, that's all right. Sorry, I didn't know. I can. No, I apologize. We'll, we'll trim out the beginning here. I'm just getting my notes in front of me. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. This will be our fourth episode of Engineering in Life. Uh, these presentations are an opportunity for working engineers to talk about their careers or their paths up to their current career. We hope that you guys will continue to join us for future presentations. Today, we have Justin A. Cordaz, also known as Jack on the Discord, uh, who's going to be presenting their project spotlight. If you have any questions at any time, you can type them into the thread that was created in the large meeting room channel. Uh, and we'll address any questions at the end of the presentation. You can also keep general conversation about the presentation in that thread. Uh, we will be monitoring it, of course, to make sure that things stay on topic. If you have anything off topic, we ask that you put that in the large meeting room channel or in whatever channel may be relevant for whatever discussion you may be having. Uh, this session is being recorded. A link to this session will be shared in our announcements channel when it's posted on our YouTube channel. Everyone is welcome to share their story with regards to presentations. If you think you might like to give a presentation yourself, we encourage you to message myself or any other member of the event coordinator staff uh, or any admin or moderator and they'll get you to the right place. If you enjoy this presentation or learn anything new, we ask that you share our Discord link or our YouTube channel and try and get people to join our community and have more fun with us. With that being said, I'm going to pass it off to Justin for his presentation. Hey guys, thanks Chase for that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Justin. I've been practicing structural engineering now since about 2012. Um, I started while I was at an undergrad um, and I started with some residential work and into some forensic stuff for a little while until I ultimately ended up in private um, commercial design such as as this project here. Um, so the project that I'll be presenting here is a project in the Boston, Massachusetts area. Uh, it's the Encore Boston Harbor Hotel. Um, you may know it as the, the Wynn Casino. Um, it's very similar to the one that we have out in Vegas. Um, this is a very close replication from what I hear. I've never been to Vegas, so I don't know for sure. Um, but very close to it. As you can see on the sign, it says Win on the top of the tower there. Uh, that sign has changed since this rendering. It is actually named Encore. Throughout this project, uh, throughout this presentation, you will see it referred to as Win in a few spots. Just know that was the original name and it has been changed over to Encore. Uh, so just don't get confused when you see when you see those. So. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to go through. We uh, we're going to go through a project overview, some statistics of the project. We're going to talk about some different structural systems of the project while we're here. All the different parts of the building that we're going to be um, that are, were involved. Some signage for the screen or the screen that was designed to hold up the signage. Um, talk about the fact that on this project we had some uh, some very in depth location for us where everyone was in one room together and just talk generally about how accelerated some of this construction project actually went. So there were some of the main players on the design team were wind design development themselves as the interior designers, Jacobs as the architect, McNamara Salvia as the structural engineers, Jacobs were also the MEP engineers, uh, GZA was the geotech and bowler engineering was the civil engineer for this project. <clears throat> On the construction side, this was a Suffolk construction project and there were a variety of contractors involved and suppliers that were involved in, in, the, in the, this project itself. So some facts about this project is all in all, it was estimated to be about $2.4 billion for the development of this project. And it is, it was, and I believe still is the largest single phase private development in the history of Massachusetts. 
Um, that $2.4 billion development cost uh, price has actually gone up. I believe now it's closer to $3 billion uh, by the time this was all done. But when this presentation was created, it was estimated to be about $2.4 billion. Uh, oh, $1.4 billion of that is Navy Ace Pirates. What's that? Uh, $1.4 billion. $1.4 billion of this cost was in hard construction costs. Um, while this was going on, the, the building itself is 3.1 million square feet and the footprint of the building. So the area that the foot that the building is actually sitting on is about 11 acres. Um, we have a four story below grade parking garage and a 29 story mm -hmm. tower that sits on top of that. <clears throat> The central utility plant, also known as the CUP, is approximately two, uh, 260,000 square feet, and the casino itself is about 300 square feet. Um, 12 acres of road and landscaping are on it, and the hotel itself has about 670 plus hotel rooms, um, with the smallest hotel room being about 600 square feet, 4,000 gaming positions, 10 restaurants, and the size of the garage in this building can fit six Boeing 777 jetliners inside it. So this is to scale just the footprint of the garage with six Boeing 77s inside them. <clears throat> so this is an aerial view of a rendering of this. And we can see here, you know that there's a way, here we go. Um, this red box here, this is the where the underground garage is where you saw those airlines inside. A little wedge back here. This is that cup. This is the utility area where you have all the mechanical systems, where you have the air vents, where you have all the back of house stuff, uh, including the vault of the casino is back here. Um, this curved structure right here, this is the, the hotel tower itself. Um, this area up front here, this is a convention area where you have a, a large clear span ballroom, which we'll get into a little bit later on. Um, we have some greenery and some landscape. Um, this waterway actually had to get dredged. And when I say dredged, I mean ships went in there and dug the dirt out from the underside of the, uh, below the water to make it deeper um, because there is a ferry service that will take you from somewhere outside of the area into the casino through a ferry service. <clears throat> so inside of the parking garage itself, because of it being a four story garage, we used a slurry wall system all the way around. And what a slurry wall is, is basically a concrete wall that's installed before the soil is removed. And so they do that with these special pieces of machinery that drop into the ground and just use augers to rip all the dirt up and they make a large hole inside the ground and they fill it with slurry uh, to keep the dirt from falling in. And then they drop a rebar cage inside of that hole and they put a tremi pipe down and pump concrete inside and push all that water and slurry and, and muck that's inside there, push it out so that at the end you end up with basically a large concrete wall cast inside of the dirt. And what that accomplishes is it allows them to actually dig all the way down without needing to set up a bunch of, of um, SOEs or supportive excavation as it's called to retain all that dirt and soil around. We'll see some photos of that as we um, as we move forward. There's also a large concrete mat, some pre-stressed rock anchors and LBEs to support some of the structures and LBEs are just load bearing elements. So all that load that we have coming down from the tower and the rest of the structure needs to get supported somehow and they get supported by the LBEs. And we'll talk more on the other projects, uh, the other aspects as we move a little forward. <clears throat> so the slurry wall itself is a 30 inch thick wall, as I was saying before, made solely out of concrete. And they are into the bedrock by at least two feet. Um, how do I stop with this? There. <clears throat> 
they're into the bedrock by at least two feet. Some of them are deeper, depending on the location and the quality of the um, the quality of the rock itself. Uh, sometimes they have to go a little bit deeper, just based on the fracturing of the of the rock. These are some of the details that we had here. So at the top of the slurry wall, on the left, it's cat beams where the slab ties into it. The middle one are uh, some of the slabs cast on dirt, tying into the slurry wall towards the bottom. And on the right is another cat beam detail that we had where slabs tied into it. We can also see lower on the left and right slurry wall where the slabs underground tied into the, into the walls as well. So this is a photo um, during construction. So this wall on the back side here, this is a slurry wall. And as you can see, it's concrete. You can see in this area here, in this area here, these circles that are sort of cast uh, that we can see marks of. These are the circles of the auger that dig the hole. Um, so the auger stopped in the dirt or moved a little to the side and made these grooves in the dirt while it was digging down. And so in the concrete was put inside, it kept in shape. These strands that you're seeing coming out these are soil anchors. These are, are, are pre-stressed soil anchors. Um, and they are going down into the soil to help hold this wall up to stop it from tipping over. This is, at the end, is a four-story retaining wall, essentially. So these pre-stressed anchors help hold it up and make the structural system um, much more efficient with this use. What they're doing here is they are pouring the lower mat slab, and the mat slab is the ground is the one that's on the on the ground, just a very thick mat. Um, this one was um, I forget exactly how thick. We have a slide on that a little bit later on, but this is them placing some concrete down here with the slick line breaking it off as they shorten the run. <clears throat> so this is the installation of those rock anchors um, or or these these tiebacks that are getting installed into the wall and it's following closely to the excavation. As the dirt gets removed, anchors keep getting installed. <clears throat> so the mat foundation is 36 inch typical, um, 36 inches thick. However, under the hotel, which is the tower, it thickened up just because of the increased loading. Um, most of the slab, most of the concrete is a 6,000 PSI compressive strength concrete or higher. Here's another view of the mat slab getting cast. And we can see the start of one of the core walls starting here. We can see some slurry walls around the perimeter. We can see the start of one of the elevated slabs for the parking deck here. And we can see one, two, and three tower cranes in this view. <clears throat> Not to mention the variety of mobile cranes, rock anchor rigs, which we'll touch base on in a, in a minute. Um, and just a variety of people working around here. At the peak of construction on this project, there were over 3,000 construction workers on site working 24-7. Not all 3,000 were working 24-7, um, but we would have uh, over 3,000 employees on this site at once. Um, so here is the mat slab for the tower crane. So here's the base for the tower, one of the tower cranes to be installed in the mat to support and hold all the loads from this tower crane. <clears throat> so this is a detail for a rock anchor. Um, with this garage being four stories underground, we essentially made a giant bathtub. We are right on the water with this building. So water table is ground elevation. Um, because of the cost of having an underground dewatering system and the maintenance for that so that we didn't have any hydrostatic uplift. Every 30 feet in the middle of a bay, one of these rock anchors were installed and it was drilled straight down into the ground, finding bedrock, tying in. And what these rock anchors do is as that water pushes, uh, creates the hydrostatic pressure on the underside of the slab, pushing it up, these rock anchors hold the slab down these are essentially the only things stopping this whole structure from floating away from the water. 
So here's another picture. This is some of the installation efforts of these rock anchors with these rigs. This is the gauge that they use to put some free stress on the anchors themselves. <clears throat> so the garage and hotel foundation system here, the hotel was supported on LBEs and LBEs are essentially um, slurry walls, same concept, the same system drills into the ground in order to um, put the rebar cage in and cast the concrete. The difference with this is these are designed specifically to take axial load um, and they may be designed for some, some bending moment as well, uh, but generally they are used for vertical loading where piles or shallow foundations aren't going to work. Um, these were drilled much deeper into rock than the slurry walls. Slurry walls had a minimum, uh, minimum embedment of two feet. These have a minimum embedment into rock of five feet. Um, and the highest one is socketed 22 feet into rock. <clears throat> so all the columns of the hotels, all the column of the structures, all ultimately end up on one of these LBEs. So as we were mentioning before, there is no permanent under mat dewatering system. And so we have all of that hydrostatic pressure that we had to fight against. And that's what these rock anchors are for. And not only did we design for the water level to ground, we designed it to the 100 year base flood elevation from FEMA. So that's even higher. I believe that was, I believe here it was six or seven feet above, above ground. Um, but it's been a long time since I've thought about that, so that number could be wrong. <clears throat> so the podium and the cup, the podium is essentially the main gaming area. Um, and the cup is the utility area that we talked about before. For the rest of this building where we didn't have heavy loads, we did use some piles, micro piles, precast piles, all different types of smaller structure, getting, dig, uh, getting placed into the ground to support the loads. Um, <clears throat> we had all different types of cast in place tie beams, foundation walls, structural slabs, some poured on grade, uh, some elevated. We had some slab on metal decks um, and a variety of, of other structural systems throughout. So the garage level has four levels. All of them are 10 inch cast in place concrete slab, um, all mildly reinforced with a 6,000 PSI concrete. Um, we used a very consistent grid of columns here to try to make the design as efficient as possible. Um, and on the floor up above is where we, as we got out of ground, we had a bunch of transfers and we adjusted the structure a little bit so that we could large and uh, enlarge those spans as, as we moved up the building. Jack. So what really doing, quickly, would it yeah. be okay to ask a question because it's relevant to the foundations? Um, yes. Emily wants to know what were the main design considerations of the underground parking structure so close to the dredged waterway for the ferry? And did the strip, um, did the strip of land between the two have to be specially reinforced? No. Um, all of the slurry walls in the mat slab have been completely waterproofed. Um, so any water or anything going on um, outside of the building, liquid wise, is not able to actually make it inside. Um, there is some drainage systems um, to sort of help any water that runs into the building um, get pumped out, but anything that's from the ground going in, um, it, it can't really get in anything that does seep in slightly does get pumped out though. I'm, I'm not sure if that answered the question or not, but. <clears throat> All right. Um, so this is a lot of the stuff we already talked about actually. We wanted to maximize the number of parking spaces in here with the simplified grid. Um, as I mentioned, we basically created a bathtub about this with everything being watertight and we didn't have the underground dewatering system this whole building just wants to float away um, and the 30 foot typical bays 
made it so we didn't have to consider close tension for underground work and the contractors could uh, in their in, in their view could move a little bit quicker with the construction so this is a photo of the construction of the garage we're a little bit further forward than some of the other photos where we have completely excavated um, the soil already and we've started to place the slab in strips so they get this one strip moving at the same time as this strip moving and they're working on the lower floors and sort of gearing it up as as we move on um, a fun fact about this garage actually um, this soil is all contaminated so it had to get sent away to somewhere to be treated properly and they toyed with a lot of different ideas of how to actually remove the soil um, with trucks or boats and ultimately the cheapest way for them to be able to do this and remove all the soil from the from the property was actually to lease a train so we have train tracks here so they had one they might have even had two trains that were parked here constantly so as they were digging out the soil they were placing it into the train cars and the trains after they got filled would take off to wherever they are going and dump and dump all the soil out the only job site i've ever been on where they actually had to take a get a train to remove all that soil <clears throat> so here's another view where we can see more of the slurry wall another part of the structure we got some tower cranes. This is one of the core walls of the of the hotel tower, and this is a placing boom for them to place concrete up at higher floors. Um, another tower crane here, and more of this decking for them to pour the concrete slabs on top of. Just another view from a different perspective where we can see the ramps, some conventional reinforcing here. This blue line that we can see down here this is some electrical tubing um, for them to be run wires inside of the concrete slab itself. Here we can see the formation of another slurry wall, I'm sorry, uh, shear wall inside of the hotel. Here's another shear wall inside the hotel and these spikes coming out are the third core wall of the hotel or shear wall, I should say. <clears throat> now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the podium superstructure inside here there were a variety of different things back of house offices game the central gaming public spaces convention center spa salon offices and entertainment <clears throat> so the regular gravity system of this was steel framing with concrete slab on metal deck so ultimately it was a seven and a half inch deck three inch composite metal deck and with four and a half inches of concrete on top <clears throat> Here's a picture of some of the steel erection going on, where we have the steel columns, the metal decking before any concrete's been poured on. This decking hasn't even really been detailed. Um, so inside of this podium, there were areas that have some really tall ceiling heights and some very long spans. Uh, they also were adamant about using a curved escalator, which there's only one manufacturer that produces them, Mitsubishi and it only comes in one size and shape that's it so because of of that being in only one size and shape it really governed the elevation of our second floor um, and then we have a very large garden lobby skylight 82 feet by 54 feet clear span glass skylight um, and the structure of that skylight is supported by 66 inch and 78 inch plate girders <clears throat> So this is just another view from on the site where we can see uh, one area of the podium here and another area of the podium to the right. This is actually the area where concrete trucks would park and pump concrete through the slick lines here um, into one part of the building. <clears throat> so because of the size of the building, Part of the building became used specifically for the central utility. That's the cut portion that we talked about earlier. Um, the size of the building, it moved a lot when we were looking at um, any lateral cases, seismic and wind. And because of that, we had to look at thermal joints and uh, lateral joints to be able to allow the building to move 
during construction um, and to be able to move in any sort of seismic or, or, or wind event. This building was governed by seismic just because of how short it was and the mass of it. Typically in the area that this is, it's usually governed by wind. However, in this particular case, it, it, it was not. <clears throat> Here's another view of some of the steel framing. So this is from a model from the, uh, the general contractor showing a lot of the mechanical, the plumbing, the pipes, the HVAC, everything going on under the structure. Here's a different view. So we can see that there was just a lot of stuff in small areas. And this is what it looked like in reality, all these pipes. Um, all of them are hanging from the structure above. Steel beams were installed specifically for these hangers to go and be able to grab onto. So something to think about with those pipes if you're doing this type of work. Try to get as much information as you can from the architect early on about what their plan for mechanical loading is. And once a contractor is involved, try to get realistic weights about the piping that's going to be there um, because that can get you into a lot of trouble if it's something that you haven't considered or if you didn't take in, into account uh, in, with the right the right quantity of pipes. So up here, this is a cooling tower surrounded by a screen wall. Um, and this is all going to get cladded, so none of this equipment gets, uh, gets seen. <clears throat> So all the different facades were going around here to try to keep the look that they wanted and they all weighed quite a lot, 10,000 pounds each of different type of uh, different type of materials, fiberglass, concrete, um, structural steel, stone. We had some steel structure that we made on a curve part of the building uh, for them to hang the stuff off of. They had some weird awnings here to give them the look that they wanted, the, the wasted awnings as they call them. This is where you see the main entrance. This is on the, the edge of the building that's against the road. Um, we're starting to see some staircases getting built here, some other framing going on, and this is them starting to put facade on the building and sculpt and shape the way that the exterior of the building is going to look. The podium had that convention center, which is going to be a, a, a ballroom, and they needed a very clear span, um, 133 foot long clear span. So we had trusses. This is a picture of the truss that was a clear span, and we had a series of these going above the ballroom so that it would be completely clear span. Um, and we had hung operable partitions that could be moved around so that the walls could be partitioned and, uh, and set up in certain ways based on events and based on any activities that the hotel was hosting at the time. So this is some framing that we had around the perimeter in green, and it actually mounted to a girder truss. So it's a, a slightly stiffer truss than the regular trusses. And it was to account for the fact that these trusses spanning this 133 feet are very flexible relative to a steel beam spanning 20 feet going from column to column to column. This area here is a much stiffer element. And so the plate girder or the, the girder truss, I should say, takes that weight and it helps transition the stiffness from the softer trusses into a, a harder system where we have columns and, and tighter spacing members. This area outlined in red here, this is the area of all the clear span trusses and you can see some of them have already been installed over here, and there's some underneath this metal roof decking here as well. This curved area of the building is where that curved steel framing for the facade um, was, would, has been installed. <clears throat> so the lateral system, we had to consider all SE7 code loads at the point in time. It was the 2005 code was used for this. Um, wind exposure category B and site class D for seismic or seismic design category B as well. So we used large steel braced frames for the structure. Um, the fact that there were a majority of or, or a large variety of different flooring systems, we had to have steps 
and pits and step uh, and step ups all over the place in the slab for the flooring and those depressions in the slab and the dropped bays and all of the weird things that we had to do with the slab um, it made it really hard to actually drag some of this lateral loading from these braces into into the ground or anywhere throughout the building so anywhere that we could that was reasonable we tried to put braces in to bring them down to where to bring the load down to where it needed to go <clears throat> So because of the look of all of this, we, we really, this just goes into more along the lines of what we were talking about earlier with the braces. We couldn't just put them everywhere. We, we tried to put them anywhere we could, but we couldn't really get long lines of them. We, we had to put them everywhere that we could reasonably fit them and figure out a way to drag all that lateral load down to ground. So as we get into the hotel structure, which is the tower, <clears throat> it had um, the first few levels were thicker conventionally reinforced slabs um, to allow for more mechanical or ease of, of mechanical coordination, possible future coring as they expanded. Um, and then level four was just a hung steel catwalk hung from level five level five was the first post tension slab that this project had um, and it was the thickest slab as well most of the floors were 10 inch thick slabs um, one portion of it was a little bit thicker by an inch just to increase the stiffness to reduce some of the deflections the mechanical areas went to a thicker slab just based on the load to try to reduce the deflection and the roof was an 11 inch slab to account for all the movement of the roof screen, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. These slabs in the hotel were cached with 8,000 PSI concrete. Um, and that's due to the fact that the core walls for the lateral system um, were based with anywhere from 12,000 PSI concrete to 8,000 PSI concrete. And when you have concrete of that high of strength, the the two concretes have to be within a certain range of compressive strength from each other. And in order for us to achieve that, we had to go with an 8,000 PSI slab compared to a 6,000 that we did in other locations. The PT inside of these slabs after the concrete was placed, those tendons were pulled. Once the concrete strength got to approximately 3,000 PSI or higher. So this is a picture of the, of the floors. Here's the level one two and three of the cast and play slabs. And this is the forms for level five. Level four is a steel catwalk that was hung from the underside of level five here. <clears throat> There's another view from the other side so we can see the curve of the structure and we can see the other buildings or the other floors going up the tower here. This area, this big square opening here this is the big skylight um, that we talked about earlier. <clears throat> so this is one of the floor plans that we, part of the floor plans that we had. The bays of the hotel had much longer spans, upwards of 40 feet. Um, and so we had to do a little bit more reinforcing out in this area. And we have the cantilever balconies for these, uh, for these suites in the, in the hotels here. This is a view a picture of some of these post tension slabs. So these red tendons that we're seeing spanning around, this is the post tension cable. We can see here all of these things sticking up are part of the mechanical operations here. Sleeves for piping, electrical wires. These red things are for plumbing, uh, for tubs. Um, some box out for other shafts to go through. This is the formwork for one of the core walls inside here that is rising up with everything. Once again, a different view of the post-tension system. Different view of the post-tension. These are the anchors at the edge of the slab. <clears throat> so this, we took into account for the lateral system here, three different core walls, which I pointed out throughout the time. One of them is shaped sort of like a C, one of them is shaped as a square, and one of them is just a single blade wall. And inside there, around the openings, we took advantage of both steel plate girdling beams 
and conventionally reinforced uh, concrete link beams. Here's one of the details for the steel link beams where we have it embedded into the core wall and the steel running outside of the core over the doorway into another part of the core wall that you would see over here. So this is that one single blade wall, the start of it, this is down in the ground, and this is the shape that it held all the way up the building. As it went up, the, the thickness of this wall uh, ultimately ended up decreasing in size as we went up the building as the lateral demand um, decre uh, decreased. Here's another view of that same blade wall. This is the tower signage screen wall. So ultimately, this now says Encore. But this was designed to put the name of the building on here and to give it the look, that tapered look on the top that you see when we looked at the picture at the beginning and you see when you're driving by. This had a movable BMU system on it, um, a building maintenance unit. So there's tracks. And you can see a little bit of the gray here on this rendering. It's not the best rendering, rendering for it. But there's tracks that wrap around this entire screen wall system for this unit that operates to hang people down off of it to clean the windows, to do any maintenance work, to lift and replace units on the roof. Um, it's able to just roll around and, and provide them service wherever they need it to. Um, <clears throat> so that screen wall at the highest end is 60 feet tall and the lowest end is 19 feet tall. And every 38 to 40 feet, you're looking at a thermal expansion joint to allow things to move around. <clears throat> Here's a section view of the drawings for, and we can see sort of the steel sizes that were made. We have some angle braces as far as some HSS tubes um, and wide flange columns. This is the detail that we show up top here for the actual um, track to be mounted to. The, the, here's the catwalk walkway for you to walk around. And this is the sloping W30 that were used for the BMU to be able to roll on. This is a the size of this project all happening at once. Speed was was speed of communication was huge. And so we had everybody involved on the design of this project co-locating co into the field office with the general contractors. They had a massive office right on site where the general contractor was there, the architect was there, the interior designers were there, us the structural engineers were there, the geotechs, the electrical, the mechanical, everybody was there. So if there was a question to be had, they were able to find us or we were able to find them. And we were able to ask the question that we needed, work stuff out together. And then if it was something that required paperwork to follow up on, uh, the contractor would follow it up with a confirming RFI, a request for information as it's called. So it really, really increased the amount of communication that we had. Um, the availability of anybody was, was fantastic. If you couldn't find the person that you were looking for, there was always somebody else um, that you could talk to that would have at least a general idea of what was going on. But the key thing about the people on the design side that were there, they had to be people that were um, knowledgeable of the project and people that could actually make decisions on the project, make design changes if needed to. Um, and be able to make calls while there without getting permission for everything that they were doing. <clears throat> so when we were out there, it was essentially business as usual. We were doing our work, we were doing everything that we needed to do, um, but we just had that increased communication. So less back and forth in emails, less RFIs, less requests for information, and we feel that it also increased the schedule because of the better communication that we had and because we did have a full-time field engineer on that site um, with the contractors every day, finding out what their issues were and finding answers for them and being able to move them on. Um, it is one of the downsides for us as the design team to be on this is we can't hide. We, we can't avoid a question for now while we try to finish up something that we're in the middle of, or we can't um, uh, essentially, yeah, try, try to avoid the question that we're being asked at that time to try to answer it later with better information, we get confronted with it and we have to be able to provide an answer then or stop what we're doing to figure out the answer at that moment in time. 
and they do the contractors do try to bring you in a lot closer into the means and methods so there is a huge or we tried to separate between final design and the means and methods of how the contractor actually accomplishes that final design um, and with us being on site at least on the structural aspect we were always being asked to get dragged in to help them figure out how to actually accomplish what was what was needed in the design <clears throat> so talking about the schedule a little bit more the design of this building started in our office in january 2015 and the cds the construction documents were were delivered in september of 2016. so a little bit less than two years in design for this to get out and and have construction documents out there as you can see with the dates in the spring of 2016 foundation excavation began and the first slurry wall panel was installed in july of 2016 and finished at the end of september 2016. but as you can see we also delivered construction documents september 2016. we had to release what's known as an early foundation package so they started to build this building off of an early release of drawings to try to help accelerate the schedule, even though we haven't actually officially released the construction documents of this building. <clears throat> so the garage mat, so they excavated it all um, from between September 2016 to January 2017 for the excavation. Um, the garage mat was placed starting December 2016 and finished June of 2017. 65,000 cubic yards of concrete in six months. The first piece of steel was erected in January 2017, and the last piece was placed approximately in November of 2017. 11,500 tons of steel was erected in 11 months with 12,500 individual sheets of shop drawings. 50,000 linear feet of well was on this job between fillet wells, PJP wells, CJP wells, any type of wells that were done, 50,000 of weld, nine and a half miles of weld if you put them all end to end. Six tower cranes were on site, as well as one crawler crane for continuous use. The third level of the hotel was poured on June 28th, 2017, and level 28th was topped off sometime in March of 2018. <clears throat> the building was weather tight by April of 2018. Now we just have some overview pictures of the construction site here. So here's the hotel portion starting to get built. Here's the convention center. This is the crawler crane that thing. And we can see here one, two, three. Oh, some of the tower cranes that were over here actually got removed. So we're not going to see all the tower cranes in this picture. Um, but at one point in time, this looked like a tower crane yard with the amount of tower cranes that were on the site here. Um, this white stuff that we see down here is some geofoam for them to raise the dirt. Uh, I believe we went up about 12 feet over here to slope up the drive lane to get to the port for share. This is that opening for that large skylight that's going to be installed. <clears throat> Once again, these are the large trusses that are clear spanning the ballroom that's down here. This is the waterway that got dredged. This is some of the excavation work that was being done. This is actually the very end of the excavation. Everything else is done. This is the last of the dirt. <clears throat> so we had the great alls down in the in the in the hole with them, moving all of the dirt closer into this pile while we had the large excavators over the top pulling the dirt out of the hole itself. Another view of the hole where we can see the rock anchors getting installed, column cages sticking up out of the slab. Slurry walls, crane lifting up some holes, some structural steel, some curved steel decking. <clears throat> this is one of the large plate girders used to support the skylight. Um, this is the full length of the tractor trailer uh, bed, and this is only half of the plate girder span. So this, these are the plate girder spans here. Here's a person right in the middle here for size. We can see the long clear span of it. This piece here on the left is the size of the member that was on the back of that tractor trailer. 
large moment splice connection of that plate girder because of the size of it it could not be shipped in one piece and so they had to actually put a splice together uh, out in the field and you can sit here and count the bolts um, i looked for the bolt numbers and i could not find the documentation that we had that told us what the bolt numbers were and i really didn't want to count there are a lot of bolts for these connections so we can see this is the cup portion here and this is the main area of the podium where the gaming area is going to be we can see in detail a little bit closer the trusses over the ballroom floors we can see how tightly spaced they are there is actually some openings through these to allow catwalks to span for people to be up top for lighting or other utility work uh, to, to do stuff that they needed to up here um, here's another view of those clear span of the trusses this these trusses are spanning 133 feet <clears throat> Here's a view from inside, sort of a uh, fisheye view showing the whole truss as well as the excavation was going on. Not the excavation, the construction was going on, erection. We can see more tower crane pictures, the curvature of the hotel, some more concrete slabs. These yellow posts are the shoring systems to help support the slab and to make the concrete slab after it's been placed but not fully cured. Uh, so that that slab itself doesn't take as much load as um, as is placed on it and the load that gets pushed on it is distributed between a, a series of slabs while they cure and reach their ultimate design strength and this yellow rectangle that you see on the side um, this is the start of the installation of um, a system called LPS it's basically a system that climbs uh, uh, after they got up a little bit further, this was installed around the entire tower, not just in this one spot. And what it does is it gets lifted up the building as the building grows, and it provides fall protection for the workers on the working deck from falling off, um, debris from the working deck from flying off during any storms. Um, it also prevents debris from a couple of floors below the working deck from falling off the building. It just completely encapsulates the working area and ultimately makes it safer for everyone involved. Here we can see that yellow system, the LPS system getting installed around the building a little bit more. And like I said before, ultimately this wraps the entire structure. <clears throat> this is the decking of the slabs before anything is installed. After the decking is set up to go, the mechanical personnel get put on site to start putting in any sleeves, any bangets, anything that they need for their utilities on the bottom of the slab before any rebar starts getting laid down and everything just gets in their way. Another view here of the rebar and the post tension around here. Some stud rails to prevent shear of the column or shear of the slab at the columns. Some more in slab conduit. This is the guys working out here, placing concrete on the right while they have a guy walking around with a vibrator here to try to consolidate all of the concrete and then working, placing and smoothing it out ultimately. <clears throat> Here's another view of the casino. As it's starting to go up, we can see the higher space flooring. This is level three up to level five. And we can see the huge clear span. And that once again is because we are hanging level four catwalk on the underside of that level five slab. So that is all that I have here. If uh, there's any questions, I'll, uh, I'll take them now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we have a few questions. I try to hold them back, but they were animals. Um, <laughs> uh, Emily wanted to know again, uh, kind of just a little bit more example explanation for uh, the main design considerations for the question. This might be changed. This might have been modified a bit, but if you could just kind of try. Yeah. Can I can I explain what I meant? Please. Yeah, yes, thanks. Um, so I was more interested uh, if you obviously dig out a big, uh, a, a lot of earth for, um, you know, a the uh, the parking structure um, and then like right next to it, you dig up, out a lot for the ferry system. I would worry about the structural integrity of the strip of land that's dividing the two, not necessarily the water migrating. Mm -hmm. But just because it's like a thin strip of land between basically two holes, 
uh, did that require like additional structural support or anything like that? That's that was kind of what I was trying to ask. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so there's two aspects. You've got the, the the work done to the building and the work done in the water. We'll talk about the building first, then we'll move out to the water. Um, the slurry walls for the building actually make it so once everything was excavated, those walls are designed to take all the soil loading, all the water loading, all everything. So as far as all the soil outside of the building is concerned, nothing's different. Even after all that soil is gone on the inside of the building, as far as the soil outside of the building is concerned, nothing's different. Um, as we get to the water, the fact that they dredged it down and removed some of the soil um, it's not a straight cut. It's not something where they where they cut it down like we did for the garage where we where everything was squared off and it has a harsh drop. Um, dredging it ends up being a little bit tapered. Um, so it's not as harsh of a change. But we there was also a seawall added around um, around the perimeter there. One for when the boats land, they don't damage anything. Um, but two also to help with uh, some of the retaining of the soil at the water. And we actually, and I, I didn't mention it before, um, that soil actually had to, we had to create land out there a little bit. Um, at one point we had to drill a bunch of piles and I, I shouldn't say we, this was the geotechnical engineer, wasn't something that we as the structural engineers were involved in, but they dri uh, drove a bunch of piles or designed a bunch of piles to be driven in um, and some gravel and soil to basically make fake land on the water a little bit so that we could get a little bit more frontage on the property. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That was that answered my question. I appreciate it. Some sauce. Okay, second question. How on earth does this get coordinated? The scale is impressive. I know it's partially <laughs> complimented, but it's a really good question. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the challenge on every project, no matter the size. Um, <clears throat> coordination is probably one of the most important aspects on a project, and it challenges everyone, no matter how long you've been doing it, no matter if you've been in the industry for one year, or if you've been in the industry for 20 years, if you're on the design side, if you're on the construction side, um, it's, all, it's all difficult. But on this project, we used BIM a lot, um, information modeling. So most of our stuff was done in 3D. So our drawings were modeled in, in Revit. So we were able to put steel beams and everything that we needed into it. The architect did his best to design the structure and tell us where any mechanical penetrations needed to be, where sleeves for pipes or sleeves for electrical needed to go, where duct openings needed to be. Um, and we worked those openings around our structure or we worked our structure around those openings as required. Um, and then ultimately once a contractor gets involved, they take all that information and they get subcontractors involved and they take all of these 3D models that we've created um, and, and sort of meld it together. They take them all and hone them in a lot more. So the steel fabricator will take and create their own structural steel model that is way more detailed than any structural engineer's model will ever be. And that shows you everything, gusset plates, that shows kickers, that shows anything and everything. Um, the contractors will be coordinating with their, um, with all of their other subs for their specific trades, mechanical, um, sheetrock, everything. And it all gets pulled into um, a common system that one of the systems that's used is Navis Work. Another one is BIM 360 Glue. And all of these softwares sort of link all the models together. And I might be botching this a little bit because I'm not too involved with the coordination aspects to, to an extreme degree, the way that the contractors are. Uh, but the way that I understand it is there are all of these models sort of get pulled into one place. And you can see everything in one go. And the programs can do a little bit of clash detections. Um, and point out some errors, but a lot of times it's people just working through stuff that start seeing where structure interferes with mechanical or mechanical interferes with architecture. Um, and so that's how design everything is coordinated. But then when you actually get out to site and the construction actually starts, 
everything is done based on, on um, coordinates and GPS systems. So they have these systems out there that let them know exactly where they are and they'll walk around with these rods and I, I don't know what they're called, but um, they'll walk around and they'll lay out the entire structure. They'll know where every corner needs to be. They'll know where the hole needs to start to be dug. They'll know where each column needs to go. Based on all of these drawings and models that were created before, they can take those models and import them into um, a GPS system for them to be able to do that out in the field. And then as far as getting all of this stuff done at once, the contractor really has to work through his logistics and coordinating time um, to make sure that everybody's working at once as efficiently as possible without getting into everyone's way and without having um, one part of the construction process lagging behind that interferes with others. It's known as the critical path and to make sure that that critical path item is ultimately moving and out of the way so that it's not holding the rest of the project up. Um, but no matter how you slice it, no matter how you look at it, coordination of any project is, is, is a challenge. Put that into the question. Third question is, you said the soil had to be re the soil that had to be removed was contaminated. What is this soil that needed to be replaced or was it just handled in a special way because it was contaminated? That's a great question. So it was, it did not have to get replaced. Um, it got removed off site and I forget where it got shipped to. I believe we shipped it to Clean Harbor. Or I believe Clean Harbors took it and did some work with it. And I'm not exactly sure what they did, but we never had to see it again. Um, because all the soil that was removed was for the garage, or the majority of the soil that was removed was for the garage. Um, but I know they had to treat it with some, uh, do some work with it so that it could be stored elsewhere, um, but I, I'm not exactly sure what that was. Um, I'm gonna add to that question, because I was curious. Uh, um, do you guys back do any backfilling like the soil that you kind of remove from one area do you try to backfill in another area was that not even necessary for this project um on this project there wasn't a lot of that um but also because the soil was contaminated it, it could not be reused uh, so there were a few areas that we needed soil just to sort of raise the ground or change the profile of the land and any soil that we took off the site we were not allowed to use without it being treated. <clears throat> they, sent the they sent all the bad soil to a school for wayward soils. Um, the fourth question is, were the components co components custom that you know about or that any of them that you were involved in, were they custom made or bought standard and then manipulated? Like we already know about the oh. elevator, I mean es escalators, but are there any other parts that were custom? Um, most most of this stuff ended up being custom as far as I'm aware. Um, you had to, a lot of the steel beams had to be bent for certain profiles that they wanted. Um, those those waste awnings, those all had to be custom made as, as desired. Um, so a lot of this stuff, um, as far as the structure and the shape of the building itself had to be customized. Um, on the inside, as far as hubs and fit outs and um, electrical outlets and all of those things. As far as I know with that, there weren't too many of those that had to be custom made. I know that there were a lot of things inside the hotel rooms that needed some custom programming. Um, they wanted to set up a way so that as soon as somebody new got to that hotel room, they scanned their card on the door to unlock it it would send a signal to their room and all the blinds would automatically open up. The lights would automatically turn on. The temperature would automatically get set to a certain temperature so that when you walked in, you were always the, new to the room. You would always get this very um, unique feel. Um, so I know that that system had to be customized and they had to do a few, uh, few customizations to some systems for certain UL ratings. Um, and then there was a $29 million Popeye statue that was an art piece that was in here for a while. That was definitely custom made, not specifically for this, but it was bought for this. Um, and then that's about all that I can put on that one. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, one more question is, what was your role in all of this? Were you directly, was it directly your responsibility? And what was the hardest part of integrating this piece into the rest of the puzzle? Did you, and did you seek out a holistic understanding of the project or is it just part of your job duties? This is a couple of questions. So basically, what exactly is it that you did here? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so I was very new to Maxow when this project was going on. So I was not the party responsible for um, for for any of it. Um, since day one with Maxow, I was on this project and I was involved in all of it. Um, but I was not one of those main decision makers, at least not when when I started with them. But a project of this size is handled by multiple people. So there were three project managers in my office that were running this. One person was running the podium, the structural steel part of the building. Um, one person was running the cup, uh, I'm sorry, the, the garage, and one person was running the tower um, just to make sure that everything was getting done and, and handled properly. Uh, it's just way too much work for one person to really be able to do anything. Um, I spent a lot of my time at the beginning um, actually on the site with the contractors. Um, I was the, the field engineer when I first started out there, um, working with the contractor and figuring out what their issues were um, and then finding solutions. Then ultimately, as I spent more time there, I did become one of those decision makers for the hotel as we got towards the top of it. Um, but my work mostly focused around concrete um, and less on any of the things related to the steel. All right. Yeah, too good. Um, on this, uh, being someone that started, you said not at uh, not the initial decision maker that then they became. Did you were you heavily involved in the design of it, and then maybe as you went up, you pulled away from the structural mm -hmm. design, or were you involved in the technical design the entire way? Um, I was involved after the design uh, was completed. I started with Max Sal January of two thousand seventeen. Okay. Um, so after the original design was done um, is when I got involved. Um, and so day one with Max Al, I got sent out to site more or less and, and was co-located with them for a year and a half on this project. Okay, um, so there was a question about furnishings that I wanted to make sure gets involved. It said at what stage and how did the furnishing occur? And I'm going to add to that on a civil as I mean on a structural aspect that they tell you some kind any specialty equipment that you'd have to factor in um, with uh, with your design calculations. Yeah. So um, basically, the way that a lot of this ends up working is you want to try to get the building the structure built as quick as possible and then watertight as quick as possible and on towers like this where you have a lot of floors you can imagine that they can be building floor 18 and floor eight and lower might be watertight already and so on level three they might be building walls so everything is sort of staged um, on, on how everything's going but they don't usually bring in anything um, nice like beds or furniture or fixtures at least from what i've seen until a lot closer to the end because of all the dust from all the materials um, as people are drywalling and sanding all that down dust going everywhere um, so they really try to keep that stuff more towards the end tubs things like that they're getting installed early um, as the, after the rooms have been sort of laid out because they're big um, but it's really all going to depend on sort of what makes the most sense sequence wise for the schedule of the project um, and then as far as things that we have to account for on a structural aspect, um, there are definitely units um, on certain projects that we have that we're made aware of um, either due to their size, due to their weight, um, due to some other requirements that they may have some odd requirements that it might be, whether it be a security concern or just a structural concern. Um, so for instance, the, the roof structure there where you see the curve all the way to the top above the name and then wanting to use that BMU system 
on tracks. We had to account for the fact that we were going to have this machine that rolled around on the tracks there. So we had to design that curvature to be able to take all of that loading. Um, and then down on the lower floors where we had the spiral escalator, the curved escalator there, um, we had to design the structure specifically around those pieces of equipment. So it definitely does happen. Um, it happens on most jobs. Um, and we just have to find a way to make what they want to use work. Was the civil, not civil, was the structural component of this project the one that was $29 million? I, I don't know if maybe I missed the total cost of this building. Oh, oh no. So the the whole project was at the time of this presentation being created was about two point four billion dollars. Oh my and god. I'm sorry, I thought I was it, on mute. No. <laughs> it got to at the end upon completion, it's a lot closer to three billion dollars. Um I've heard two point eight billion, I've heard three point two billion. Um and the hard cost of this, not not the labor, but the, the material, the hard cost was about one point four billion dollars. And that but that's everything. That's not just the structural material. That's the lighting, that's the outlets, that's the beds, the couches, the chairs, that's all of that. <clears throat> uh, one more person wants to know what was the most fulfilling aspect of this project? Um, for me, I actually thought it was the the working with the people on site, um, hearing from them, learning a bit about them, learning a lot about their lives, their home lives, um, just being able to be a, a person and personable with them. Um, working with them closely i actually learned quite a lot um just working with people that did this type of stuff every day um so for me that was probably probably the best part of this job for me um everybody if there's any other questions or comments please post them in the thread uh if not i'll start letting him wrap up I'd like to ask a question. Um, do you have any work after the project is completed? Is there any follow-up for you to do? For me personally on this project, no. I am, um, I've been, move, I've moved on to a, a lot of other projects at this point. Um, but we are still doing stuff to this building to this day. Um, changes are happening or they're finding that things aren't working the way that they wanted it to um, in operation. Um, and just a few miscellaneous aspects. Uh, we'll go out there for some investigations of cracks and the floor tile, thinking uh, people trying to think, say that it's some of the structure damaging them. Um, so we have been involved in this building since it's opened um, as well. And I think we were involved uh, as far as I know we were involved two months before COVID um, shut everything down in, in our area so I don't know if we've been involved since then because they've been shut down for a while but we have uh, we've been continuously active as a company with this building it's not me personally I'm seeing for questions and um, there are some comments are thank you for having your webcam on and also uh, thanks for the presentation. It's really interesting. I'm glad everyone liked it. I'm glad it, glad it was uh, something I could share. Pace, I'll throw it back to you to wrap up. Yeah, sure thing. Um, 
I think that was definitely an excellent presentation. I personally really enjoyed all the detail uh, that you put into it without being overly specific, of course. Um, you seem like a talented speaker, and I think many of us really enjoyed this. So thank you so much for your time um, and for sharing your knowledge and, and talking about this project. Um, I, I think you have a little bit of passion in your work here, and that was nice to see. And of course, taking the time to answer everyone's questions. Uh, which were excellent questions. Thank you for everyone here who asked those. And uh, if you have any others last minute, you know, get them in. But um, you know, again, thank you for coming. And that goes out to everyone. If, uh, if anyone's interested in giving a presentation like this one on whatever topic uh, that, that your work is related to, um, you can post a message in the large meeting room. You can a direct message myself or Ada or anyone who is on the event coordinator staff. Um, and I just want to thank everyone one last time for coming. That's all I have to say. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming out and, uh, and listening. Thank Hope you guys. Good night. Jack, once again, thank you for blessing us with your beard. That's what the people want. It's really at the end of the day. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember that this was being recorded. So I was like, no, nah, I don't do that. Uh, I think our, we are people limited on these presentations when someone is on a uh, webcam, which you tend to do. Um, and someone said that like it's because you're on webcam. And they said, well, they have to see the beard or something. Let me see. What was Interesting. It? It, it was, like I love. I thought we. Could, I don't know what, oh yeah. I thought we could get the amount of people to the room. I don't. I we can because it hadn't been an issue the last few presentations, so I've heard. But then they said it's because last.